Hello, future frightened refugees. Welcome. This is a traipse through the registry of historic places in various counties uh, and see what we can see. And this, we're not exactly searching for old world splendor, though sometimes we don't come across it. Really what we're doing is we are looking at the narratives. And what is the purpose of this? As they say it is, preserving our cultural heritage? Or is this just throwing a dog a bone? Narrative exploration is what we're doing here for you. Let me put a disclaimer on this. I'm looking at uh, all of these stories about our history, the very cynical eye, and looking for what I believe to be very contrived narratives about all these areas where we're from. So are you trying to learn how to do a nomination, a proper nomination for the, a, a property beyond National Register of Historic Places, this is not the video. You may be disappointed. If you're a little bit of a truth seeker, or you're just curious, or you uh, and you don't mind uh, having to view it through my own particular uh, magnifying glass, then I would say to thee, welcome aboard, future frightened refugee. For today, we take a traipse through Kern County. Kern. This is a county of vast size and vast treasure. From the advent of it, told, it's 200,000 acres of swampland. That's how it got its humble start. But think of it now. The the great oil wells flowing, the manifest riches and dreams that the pioneers indulged in, the cupidity and greed of clashes of strong, aggressive, resourceful men in the scramble to possess the bounties, nature. Remember then that all these riches lying about with such apparent abandon were claimed and snatched up by penniless men who could squat on a piece of government land and somehow make a living from it. And on these reflections and appreciation of the pioneer's character, the resource that enables him, allegedly, to see in faith the things that may not be realized for generations. The lack of perspective that deceives him into reaching out his hand to grasp these things that are a century beyond his time. By God, it's almost alien, isn't it? We're told that the early, I mean pre-American, pre-Spanish occupation of the area, the territory was comprised of natives of a low order of intelligence, savages, leaving barely a trace of their existence except for some rude weapons, utensils, and then their bones, lying in shallow graves or strewn about on the hillsides where some pestilence no doubt had descended upon them. These Spaniards have established missions in the area in search of savage souls to save, crossing the mountains and carrying them back with them numbers of the younger braves to the chapels, farms, and workshops where they were allowed to work. <clears throat> and of course, we taught them there were better things to eat than ate Acorns and grass seed pounded in a mortar. Give me a f***ing break. Thank you. Thank you so much for teaching us there's more to eat than acorns. We're told that these young Indians, having returned to their tribes, knew then how to work for him and steal from him and how to kill and eat his cattle. The first of these bastards who sojourned in the country were hunters, trappers, male stockmen and farmers who raised crops of corn in the rich Kern Delta or perhaps sought out the fat mountain meadows for their herds. But the fame of Kern County did not spread abroad until the eager, restless swarm of gold hunters had worked their way down from the north and found the shiny yellow yumps lumps in the Kern River placers. This is in 1851, and the great rush to Kern River happened two years later. It's true. In little by little, the area was explored, discovered, uncovered, searched out by bearded men with picks and pans and packs of beans and bacon, and mining brought about the possibility of sudden wealth, the tungsten mines, the silver mines, the copper ledges, the oil fields, the floods, the droughts. This, this is, is Kern, Kern County. County. Just under a million inhabitants currently. A million inhabitants woven into the tapas of history from the development of towns, society, homes, the building up of enterprises, the making of fortunes, the losing of fortunes, and all of this in a mere 5.2 million acres. In sort of this rectangular parallelogram here, with the corner hacked off, just beyond the line of the producing oil fields, you'll find vast fields of irrigation, some 250,000 plus acres of farmland here, oranges, lemons, cotton, cheap power, land for grazing, and just who were the people that came here and did a whole lot of moving and shaking and got their properties listed on the National Registry? Well, wouldn't you like to know? I know I would. Well, that's what I said once like a week or so ago, but now I kind of do know. And they're all mountains. And we'll begin randomly here. This real looker, the Tehachapi Railroad Depot, constructed in 1904 by the Southern Pacific Railroad. Road. The Tehachapi Depot it was one of over 60 standard plan number 23 depots built by the Southern Pacific Railroad. Between 1896 and 1916, less than a dozen of these survived. This what? is the oldest. It was, of course, constructed um, in 1904 to replace an earlier structure which had burned down the previous year. As we see time after time, time after time, time after time, time after time, time again. No 
one is alive today to provide first-hand information about the early configuration of the depot. It appears to be one of the last unembellished Southern Pacific depots in the world. By the time the depot opened, 10 passenger trains stopped in Tehachapi each day. One of the busiest rural depots in the United States. Now, eventually, the railroads withdrew from passenger service and concentrated on freight operation. The availability of automobiles and improved highways provided the excuse to abandon trains. So today, tens of thousands of visitors visit the area as they want to see this dump, which is now used as like a warehouse. But if it brought you trains, it's gotta be important, right? Is what they call the fort. That's right. The present highway happens to run right through the original area of the fort. They just couldn't put it anywhere else. And actually, you may uh, notice some similarities here in the bastion walls, if you know what I'm saying. Which they call lovingly the barracks. There are strange holes in the ground that are swallowing live trees. There's a two-story building with a partial basement. The existing buildings and ruins are now used as a parade ground. A dreary parade, if these in pictures are any indication. And why would you need a fort out here? Well, it was established in 19, or 1854 to suppress stock rustling and protect Indians in the San Joaquin Valley. They actually had camels uh, introduced here in 1858. They abandoned it, however, six years later. Great, great idea. A fort in 1840. Yeah, very likely that you then abandoned after six years <laughs> and no conflicts. I mean, I know our government wastes money, but that seems beyond reason. Back then, at least some of them had sense, I think. This beauty was built on the campus of Wasco High School. Wasco? I'm saying that right. Wasco High School. A Renaissance Revival design served an assembly hall for school functions and community events and showcased concerts, theater, dance from 1929 to 1947, playing a pivotal role in the social history of Wasco. Wasco. Now, 1915, the district was Formed. The population grew, the need for a high school became apparent to the parents, and Ernest J. Kump in 1916 built the first of these buildings. He also built this auditorium, which was completed allegedly in 1929. Considered to be a great boon to the community at the time. The liberal policy of the Board of Trustees encouraged the use of the auditorium by the community, therefore touring musicians who marveled at the acoustics, those with thespian aspirations and uh, other sordid varieties and talents, enhanced the auditorium with the richness of their performance. There was no other building in the community of Wasco in this classical style and or stature. None well left. The high artistic value of it is obvious. There are inside, however, some sort of design mysteries or, I guess, ornamental mysteries, I should say. There is a large mural that stretches over the stage, which depicts a stylized family trio of items, symbolizing things like knowledge and uh, education and uh, the halls of learning and other items whose symbolism is yet to be discovered, it says. Well, why couldn't you guys just ask Mr. Comp? Hmm? That's kind of creepy. They say that the area includes of this this area includes a place called Lost Hills. Yeah, very modern indeed. Um, the tax base of Lost Hills is primarily oil producing companies, which was obviously an important part of the construction of a project of such merit. The elegance of the building reflects the period where funds were spent more readily for institutions of learning, and we're told that this has maintained its integrity over the years. Although the artist and the meaning behind these symbols are allegedly a mystery. Well, is that so? Hmm. During Ernest J. Kump's 27 years as an architect, he designed and built 175 school buildings. The auditorium is one of his few works still standing. The following quote of Mr. Kump in a monograph he sent to the school board, not showed up since, Your town is judged by schoolhouse, for when a prospective settler comes, the first investigates what educational facilities you have for his children. You, sir, are assuming all prospectors have children. What about Stinky Pete? He doesn't have children. And no one is surprised to see the same symbolism really everywhere here as we do, you know, everywhere. And a really fantastic place that is definitely not made by Mr. Ernest J. Kump in 1925, I'll tell you that. They claim that this is a... These grills are for the future uh, installment of sound systems. Mr. Comp, you and your foresight. Your vision is unparalleled, sir. Area House. The last remaining structure from the first settlement in the Tehachapi area. James Williams, the man who first surveyed the site, gave his name to this place. Williamsburg, but the name was temporary. We changed it after he died. Uh, by 1872, the town's referred to as Tehachapa because of an, uh, it comes from the local Native Americans who applied a similar name to their nearby community. That's what we're told, anyway. This house was built between 1870 and 1875. It is believed that there is no new construction in Tehachapa after the coming of the railroad. That's weird. No new construction after the coming of the railroad, huh? Okay. By June of 19 1870, there were six empty houses in the town. 
You act as if there were lots of houses uh, empty before people moved in, and that's like, that's bizarre. It is known that a Dr. McClanahan arrived in Tehachapi in October of 1873. By May of 1876, three doctors lived here. There was continuing research in an attempt to confirm that one of these doctors built this house. We keep asking those damn doctors, and they just won't tell us. The Urea House is the only link to this period, and the only visible evidence of the first town, the historic downtown walking tour type stuff. It is assumed that the house had no electricity or plumbing at the time it was moved. There's an abandoned well and outhouse, and yeah. You have to research station. As you can tell, a place where the, quote, one variety of concept of cotton production was conceived, leading to California's planting of high-quality cotton. Experimentation at the station has continued to insist growers and improve cotton and other crops. World War One led to the need for increased airplane production because living cotton was used in manufacturing airplane wings. What? I didn't know that. The Department of Agriculture sent the, uh, sent W.B. Billy Camp the agronomist to California to conduct cotton varietal experiments that could produce the required strong cotton. He planted test plots all through California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, eventually conducting and concluding that some of the finest soils were located in the San Joaquin Valley of California. By 1921, Camp's testing program became so extensive that the need for a station was apparent. After the Kern County Land Company, the large land holding company in the area, leased him 80 acres of land for the specific purpose of conducting research on cotton. 1922, construction began on the superintendent's residence and an office building. From the station's inception, the land was used primarily for breeding and testing of various varieties of cotton. What's going on back there? In 1925, the, the results were obvious that the finest cotton variety was formed here. The governor to improve the plight of migrant farm workers. That's what this is. Many of them from the Dust Bowl. This is near Bakersville. It used to offer health care, schooling, laundry, clean, safe housing. It was a welcome haven for farmers and their families. And what a looker. Look how beautiful. You see, between 1935 and 1940, over 1 million people left their homes in Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, Missouri to escape the wind dust and drought and set off for California on what was referred to then as the Mother Road. Route 66. They left their homes. They found a better life. They heard there was a lot of work to be found picking crops where no one ever went hungry. This camp was leased to the United States Department of Agriculture, and migrants were pretty eager to settle here because it was safe. And as soon as, because as soon as they crossed over the border, they were ridiculed, rejected, and shamed. They learned the word oaky meant they were suddenly were lower class people and scum. Weed patch camp was no paradise, but for the families who settled there, it was a vast improvement of the squatter camps and their life on the road. So you see, everyone was discriminated against. In 1936, this camp housed 300 people in one room. In one room, 10 cabins. Cost a dollar a week to live there. There was a mortgage uh, executed and delivered to the Bank of America National Trust deeding this property to the United States of Agriculture for $1,200. In 1986, the newspaper reporter John Steinbeck became interested in the plight of the Okies, hence you get the uh, book The Grapes of Wrath. And thank God John Steinbeck saw them for the colorful relics of the nation's rural past rather than uneducated dirt farm Okies. Well, nothing like a little forced migration right into the loving arms of a welfare program set up for you. Anybody around here know what I'm talking about? This photograph, with its breathtaking resolution, is of the First Baptist Church, with its without question, the finest remaining example of its architectural type. Not only in metropolitan Bakersfield in Kern County, but the entire San Joaquin Valley of California. That is the opinion of this author. <clears throat> of Romanesque architecture, that is. This is seen so obviously. The cruciform plan, the hall tower in the cloister, which clearly we built, you can tell by the obvious photograph of what is clearly men on the top of this building, constructing it from the ground up. I mean, you can see from the ground over here, and you can see them on the building over here. You can see this completely uh, logical contraption here, and of course these long poles here, which are uh, very obviously um, necessary for it for something. Yep, even the sign here tells you everything. Future home, First Baptist Church, see? So, put that all together and the fact that you would definitely be parking your cars here so close to the construction. That's what you would do in a normal place. You know, you have to leave room for the uh, delivery man to come throw the lumber on the ground haphazardly. That's why you would put your cars there because you want the lumber guy, ideally, to, you know, throw them over your vehicles. Anyway, you would understand. Let's, can we get back to the, the uh, uh, details, shall we? Th thank you. Naturally, the uh, Carolingian period and also like in Basilica the room is just with the building has to be the room with the king the area oh would you say duplicates this British and Carolingian period as medieval was told to arch over all openings is vividly reproduced in this building as most exterior walls are 10 inches thick and the vast majority of openings are arches leading us to believe this is either a McDonald's or a church and there she is Jimmy left his car here the entire time can you believe it the risky bastard not a single piece of lumber dropped on his roof neither that tells you 
how sure and swift the hands are of thee. And where'd the sign go? The one that was here. That said the future first church is here. Was, was there no future for the sign? That's a tragedy. This tower, which is a Bakersfield landmark, as you can tell, is characterized by the boldness of its structure, the extraordinary vividness and dramatic tower power. So typical. So typical I can't even. Can't even what? Finish the sentence. To the west of the tower. To the wall. To the sway drop down my bars. Yeah, wrong guy, wrong time. We're talking about church, bro. This is the Fellowship Hall building, okay? It is one of the oldest buildings in the downtown business district. True. Bakersfield area has few buildings that are over 50 years old at the time of the writing. Few. They're older than 50. But this is largely due to natural disasters that have plagued the community. Namely, the the Great Fires of 1889, the major floods in 1893 and 1914, and the series of catastrophic earthquakes in 1952. The National Board of Fire Underwriters Report of 1952 had the following comments on the 1952 earthquakes. 296 structures, principally commercial and public buildings, in a 64-block central city area, were considerably damaged. Building collapses were few, but after a few years' time, 90 buildings had been torn down. We say, why collapse them? But we're just going to tear them down anyways. And so the collapses weren't actually due to the natural causes. They were due to us tearing them down within a year or so. Uh, also, 210 of them have been and or were, or and are, which means at the time, yes, but or were undergoing major structural repair and decisions were pending on demolition. We hadn't signed the documents off on it, but you know, it was heading that way. Or repair, meh, not really, of the remaining 96 for a total of 396. 300 buildings, they're gonna say were torn down, decided not to repair them, clearly. The reason to say there's no more buildings that are over 50 years old without throwing that anecdotal bit of evidence in there, if indeed the 96 were indeed opted to for repair. Does that make sense? Okay. Yet, the First Baptist Church was the only religious building in downtown Bakersville not to suffer any damage. What a superb testimonial to the design, engineers, builders, and uh, superiority of the particular god. What other conclusion could I come to? The outstanding architect was Charles Bigar of Bakersfield. Of course, born in Danville, Illinois, uh, 1882 Scotch parentage, father of a cabinet maker, learned his trade in Scotland, allegedly, raised in Danville, right, studied medicine for three years at the University of Michigan, medicine, transferred to the University of Illinois, graduated from the School of Architecture, 1906. So, of course, y usually those go hand in hand, studying medicine and transferring to Illinois and uh, graduating from the School of Architecture. At least he did it within, within reasonable time, you know, he's 24. Yeah. That's reasonable. And he studied at in Paris for three years, returned to Chattanooga, which I'm not sure, never said he was, had been to Chattanooga, but we're gonna return, I guess. Worked as a draftsman for two years. Moved to LA, associated with the firm of Clement, Morgan, and Walls. Well, he did, did have find the time to become an officer in the army during World War One, and also establish an architectural office somehow, well, when he got back, but, um... He was responsible for the creative design of many outstanding buildings in metropolitan Bakersville and the county of Kern until his untimely demise in 1946. Respected prominent design, architectural skill, that's Mr. Bigar. Uh, the Bakersville Californian, which is of course another newspaper, the building of which he designed for, had its issue carrying the cover picture and the story which said the architectural majesty of the facade of this First Baptist Church and its perfectly cruciform design, flood light at night with its Spanish arches, the noble bell tower and the handsome landscape make this edifice one of the great showpieces of Bakersfield. We use this one church for it symbolizes the aspirations of mankind everywhere for a better more meaningful life and at which point he reached into his pocket and tossed a handful of glitter in the air to the crowd's delight. And here's what she looks like today. Virtually unchanged except for Jimmy's car definitely took a bit of a downgrade wouldn't you see? I mean if you're going Going from a Model T or whatever to a, a minivan, I'd say, uh, that's a bit of a downgrade. Look how massive these doorways are. Totally necessary. Hey, that's what I think. Totally necessary. We'll move on. And you know what? While we're on the subject of Mr. Big R, we're gonna go ahead and check out this Californian building right now. The newspaper building. It was constructed in 1925, we're told. It's the home of the Bakersfield Californian. It, the, the newspaper literally, literally lives there. Which is the actual, the first uh, descendant of the news, the first newspaper in Kern County. And the county's primary source of news for 56 years. A living tribute to one of California's most admired publishers and human, and human beings. California's most hu respected human beings. Alfred E. Harrell. And despite the ravages of time, two earthquakes, it still serves in its original capacity. Look at it, there it is. Still serving in its original capacity. 
The first influx of population came to what would later be called Kern County, as we've discussed in 1864, gathering on the small mountain town of Hav Havila, Havila, perhaps, in search of gold. The first issue of this newspaper appeared August 18th, 1866, a mere two years later. Over the next six years, as the uh, mineral wealth of the area was depleted, the population shifted southward to the flat, swampy area, hardly known as Kern Island, and later to be called Bakerfield, when it was no longer an island, probably. When the newspaper became to uh, daily publication, the name was changed to the Daily Californian until 1897, in which a former Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Alfred Harrell, as aforementioned, pur purchased the paper. 1907, Mr. Hill gave the newspaper its present form, name, and under his guidance, it flourished, and in 1926, the Enterprise moved into the present facilities at this one, this street, and by street, and Beckerville. On the occasion, the official, on the occasion of the official opening of the building, Mr. Harrell received congratulations from many prominent people, including the President of the United States, Calvin Coolidge, for being one of California's most respected human beings, we, we assume, because he was. The building was then dedicated by Mr. Harrell to the service of the women of Kern County, which is very woke. And that's before woke was even a thing. So, Mr. Harrell, you're making real good on that human of the year thing. The best house, as it was called, the best house, in quotes, would provide restroom facilities. Well, a good house would, yes, I agree. Including a full-time female attendant. Full-time, even when no one's there. To women visiting downtown Bakersfield. Still, there's a woman in there. Handing out men's probably. And um, maybe rubbing your shoulders while you, you know, utilize the stand-up urinal. At least that's what happens in the men's room. And if that's not what's happening to you guys, you're hanging on the wrong places, I think. Or maybe I am. Either way, something's not right. In any case, this particular female attendant was particularly appreciated at the time, according to Mr. Richard C. Bailey, former, uh, here up to this point, uh, unmentioned former Kern County Museum Director. Because downtown business in those days did not have facilities for women. So to have facilities for women and to have a person inside of it handing out mints and feminine products well you just outdone yourself didn't you mr newspaper guy the newspaper has chronicled the history of the county and the world with the exemplary ability that an award-winning organization should during the 40s and 50s when the leadership produced more than 60 states and national awards some of them for being specific achievements as the newspaper others for being you know humans of the year and stuff and uh you know this paper we're told went to extraordinary measures to satisfy the local citizens thirst for drama i'm sorry <coughs> uh immediate word on sir front page story tells how 12,000 people gathered outside this building to get the fastest accounting of the Jack Dempsey flight. 12,000 people, huh? Standing outside as someone swapped letters around? Out, I mean, I don't know. Maybe people were bored back there, but that seems stupid. This... California paper, however, building, <clears throat> survived because, uh, well, it wasn't just a business entity, you know, it, it, it advertised. That's right, it advertised. I mean, it aided the others in advertising. Mr. Harrell was extremely active in the war bond drives during both World War I's and II's. He was a vital participant in the development of Kern County's highway system and encouraged the beginnings of the Central Valley Project, which would mean so much to agriculturalists in the area. He died in 1946. His wife, Virginia, became president of the newspaper and continued the tradition of civic leadership. He died the same year as the architect of this house died. Interesting. The only daughter, his wife, uh, became the president, yes, yes, she continued the search of civic leadership and support until her death eight years later. The only daughter of them, Bernice Harold Chipman, then assumed control of the newspaper, and she kept it active in support of the company's welfare, at which point the California donated in its entirety the printing plant and the press of the original to the museum, then the Howell House, which is behind the Bakersfield, California building, also donated to the museum when the company purchased the land for expansion purposes, but then decided, never mind, we just want to give it to the government, and we want to pay to have it moved. And then, uh, uh, the inheritant died and her daughter became president of the Californian and she and her two sons Don and Ted They're the publisher and the co-publisher. They continued the tradition of civic support service and contribution begun by their great-grandfather Kern County's history wouldn't be the same without Mr. Harrell, as he's earned a spot as one of the most influential and admired men. And we have uh, been told also, of course, uh, favorite human. Human of the year, human, human of the decade, human of the century, human of the Googleplex. And this man Harrell, who was he? Well, he was born in 1863 in Merced County. One of like three people, probably. The son of a, at the time, the son of a California pioneer who came west during the 49er gold rush. Mr. Harrell came to Kern County at the age of 19 to teach school in Tehachapi, which we've already looked at. As the age of 23, he was elected Kern County Superintendent of Schools, age 23. A teacher for three years, elected Kern County Superintendent of Schools. That's, that's plausible. He was re-elected during his second term, helped establish the county's first high school. At the age of 34, he purchased this newspaper. With no training of the newspaper work, either in the production or the business or anything like that, nothing about any institution, his ability to overcome inexperience was attested to by a selection as the 24th person named to the Newspaper Hall of Fame in 1969, which you know who that is, Mr. Harrell. 
all. His achievements as a human being were no less notable. He was acclaimed citizen number one by the local American Legion post in 1934. He was a member of the California State Parks Commission. There is Alfred, Alfred Harrell Highway is named after him. He served on the Children's Shelter Board. He promoted camperships for underprivileged children and the PTA Milk Fund drives during the Depression. He was founder and first president of the Kern County Historical Society. The architect, Charles Bigger. They say the white marble drinking fountain located at the southeast corner of the property, by the way, requires comment. So comment away. Well, at least make your comment. If you're going to make a comment about commenting, you might as well, you know. Oh, yes. Those kind of columns. Very, very believable. Easy to do. Not a problem. Do it all the time. Yep. There he is. Charles H. Bigger. He's from Texas, we're told. Where everything is, you know. And, uh, here we are at the drinking fountain of unmentionable comment. Well, um, we're told that Mr. J. M. Jameson was a resident of Kern County for 47 years. He was Kern County assessor for 16 years. He was involved in the Rendsburg Silver Mine with Mr. Harold. Well, that's new. And, uh, this fountain was dedicated to him. It's appropriate that we should close this with the mention of the Bakersfield, California plans for the future. <clears throat> now, this could be a bit sobering, so uh, make sure you're sitting down. In 1982, the Bakersfield, California broke ground on a new 35-acre, $20 million high-technology circulation production plant. So, as announced in the newspaper, the editorial and the advertising departments will continue to be housed in the building of Alfred Harrell a vital participant in the history. Um, but I'm afraid that we will no longer do the bulk of our production there, as these coffered ceilings were just starting to drive everyone absolutely bonkers. There's no room for denticulated cortices and these old world spiky sconces. No room for it. Not in our world. No, sir. Less awesome, more cubicle, please. Thank you. And uh, here's what she looks like today. Really quite gorgeous, if I do say so myself. Mr. Big R, or whomever you are, well done. Well done indeed. Glad she's still with us today. Now, admittedly, that story seemed rather wholesome. Um, you know, I'll let you decide. So this. This is the Green Hotel, he said in answer to his own question, which was constructed in 1913, just in time as the uh, entire uh, Grand Derby or whatever it was, the Grand Prix showed up at the store. You know, the routes of Santa Fe and Southern Pacific Railroad tracks that we've discussed really determined where the location of the majority of the towns and cities in the San Joaquin Valley were located. And the city of Shafter here is no exception. So immediately after the track from Fresno to Bakersfield was completed, the Kern County Land Company constructed loading platform next to the new tracks. In 1912 and 1913, the 19, uh, the uh, Kern County Land, Land Company surveyed its property in the Shafter area and advertised in newspapers that this fertile farmland was for sale. October 1913, the Land Company completed the Shafter Hotel on Central Avenue for the purpose of growing housing, providing housing for, for prospective property priors. Its opening was part of their sales campaign. The hotel served the local headquarters of the company from 1913 until 1918, during its land sales activities. Painted a dark forest green, it became known as the Green Hotel. Shafter Green Hotel was the first commercial building constructed in Shafter. In 1919, uh, Mr. Herndon Hitchcock purchased the Shafter Green Hotel and operated with his sister Marion until his death. And uh, the building then had several caretakers and it is now sadly vacant. It came to be known as the Old Hitchcock Hotel during the period that it was owned by the Hitchcock as you can guess, Shafter has well become well known for its diversification of its crops, such as potatoes, cotton, almonds, onions, garlic, and other row crops. In the 1950s, Shafter was considered the tater capital of the f***ing world. Is yes, there? It's high production levels of taters. The Shafter long white potato is well known in the western United States for its flavor and texture and sexually provocative name. <clears throat> Shafter is also one of the largest producers of garlic. The city of Shafter has grown and changed, though. It remains an agricultural hub. The spirit of resourcefulness of independence of its early days. And a bad page here and there. And, uh, okay. Great job, slideshow. Way to hold me down. Make me look stupid over here. The building used to face Central Avenue, but it was rotated nine degrees from its original position in 1938 to allow the construction of a new service station on the corner without the destruction of the hotel. So we just turned it sideways for some reason, and somehow that makes the uh, new gas station or whatever, um, I guess fit on the lot, maybe? I don't know. Its architectural integrity has been retained by its owners, past and present. Uh, the... It's only one of a few virtually unaltered buildings, this here green hotel speak of, remaining from the area of the Kern County Land Company, the major force in the development of Kern County, simplifying the spirit of the early settlers of the Shafter area, who also appear to be relatively honest, surviving years of neglect with only the most superficial damage. But upon closer inspection, their emotions are a complete and utter disaster. Records indicate that the area was sparsely settled until the arrival of about 109 families on the same day, you saw their cars, and they were Mennonites, who exchanged property in Oklahoma and Colorado for land and 
Southern California, establishing a colony six miles east of the present, originally called Martinsdale. Disbanded in 1910 for financial difficulties, Martin sold the land for cash and left for Canada, leaving the family stranded. Damn Martins, only one person remained, establishing squatters' rights. But many later returned to Shafter, which was named after uh, Henry J. Jastro, the head of the Kern County Lands Company's friend, General William Rufus Shafter, who was born in Kalamazoo County, Michigan in 1835, worked on his father's farm, taught school, joined the Union Army as a volunteer with the Michigan Infantry to fight in the Civil War, rose through the ranks as the war continued, entered the Army as a lieutenant general in 1867, acquired the name Picos Bill for his exploits as an Indian fighter. And at the outbreak of the Spanish-American War, he was appointed commanding general of the Army and responsible for mobilizing the army of the invasion of Cuba. He, among those serving under his command, were future President Teddy Roosevelt and John Pershing. General Shafter, this town's namesake, sir served as the commander of the Department of California and Columbia from 1899 to 1901. And he became familiar with San Joaquin Valley and apparently maybe this here light fixture as well. He died in 1906 and was buried with full military honors at the Presidio in the San Francisco. Therefore, Mr. Herndon Hitchcock was the owner of this place for a while. He spent his youth in the town of his birth, which was Armona, California, arriving in Shafter to manage King Lumber Company, and uh, during that time he established the Shafter Warehouse Company, which was the second business in Shafter, he served on the first Richland School Board, was Shafter's second postmaster, founding member of the Shafter Utility Board, executive director and president of the Kern County Count Chamber of Commerce, and many other organizations and associations. He was the manager of everything. Well, I'll gladly Bob Howdy. And this here hotel, not really looking so glorious, but you know, it's a relic of the past, which is what this is all about. This isn't about glory. This is about narrative. How'd we get here? Who's responsible for all of it? This national registry of historic places isn't about preserving shit. It's about preserving the narrative, okay? You take these stories that we've spun for you and you like them. And it is here that I must interject, because it's here that something began to dawn on me. Now, as you can tell, the change of tone as I'm flying through this. This was a month or two ago, I think I recorded the first part you just heard. And as usual, I'm a little dis disenchanted with what I'm finding. So let me just recap what the point of this particular series was. And I apologize if, if you've heard this before, but every now and then I find it necessary to refresh the mission statement. Now, I started going through the surveys, the Historical American Building Surveys of the States, for several reasons. One, it hadn't been done that I could find. Two, I thought it was, my initial theory going into it was that the United States had gone and taken stock of all these old world possessions, all these buildings and all these, and in order to sort of keep an inventory and see what narratives still they needed to crush, what things they still needed to destroy, just to keep stock of what was out there. And that's why I believe that there were photographs of odd things like doorknobs, fireplaces galore, foundations, doorways, random things that you would think wouldn't necessarily be your go-to target in a survey. This was my theory going into it. And as usual, what I found is not what I set out to find. It's not that I didn't find that, I and mean, there's some of that, but what I, we found, by we, I mean me, myself, and you all, in this collective journey we're on, this Council of Tomorrow, and what instead we find is that these surveys are, of, are vastly different from state to state. They each have their own approach. Um, Many of them are just pho photographical, many of them are not. California in particular, very focused on narrative, to the point where they have insanely long write-ups for very rustic properties, and they seem to be very selective. They select one home per neighborhood or town, and elevate this as if it represented the rest of the town, under the guise of preserving our heritage, and they would give them the, presumably give them the permission to destroy the rest of it, sort of throwing us a little bone there. And oftentimes I find that there's so much depth in these write-ups, sometimes very candid from some of these unwitting surveyors, and sometimes little snippets sneak through there. And what we've come to determine is that there's a hydra, there's sort of this octopus, a system that is descended upon these areas. These arms of this octopus are institutional. What we come to determine is that this power, this nexus of control, which from which this narrative spins out of, is sort of a hydra, sort of an, an octopus, with various l arms. And the arms are as follows. The banking industry, the civic or political governmental section, the military faction, the educational faction, the medical or pharmaceutical faction, and then you have your industries, mining, agriculture, transportation, when that, and that will encompass various fossil fuels, various productions for food and goods. You have the religious, or the church, I should say, faction. And within these, and you also have these, uh, these fraternal orders, YMCA's, these Freemasons, that's sort of a visible power structure. These institutions were not infiltrated, my firm belief. They were designed this way. Oh, uh, I forgot. I, I did leave out one, the insurance uh, 
industry. These industries, these institutions were not in the media, of course. Now within these areas, you have various areas of overlap. We have science, which overlaps with the agriculture, with the educational, with the pharmaceutical, with the military. You have the insurance, which touches the area of various efforts of commercial side and also the banking side. You have the church. You have the educational system and the governmental system, which is things like public libraries, museums. These are the areas of overlap. And this hydra descends upon these areas, commandeers the finest buildings, and converts them to their use, and it spreads out from there. These surveys are, more or less, simply highlighting these same institutions and buildings in every town, with, very, with, with, with few exceptions. They go to impossible lengths sometimes, detailing construction of certain things. The stories seldom make sense, and they often feature local celebrities who dabble in all these fields. Architects who are everywhere at once in the ever-present fire. Fire destroying what needs to be destroyed and also providing the narrative that which you can hide behind and claim that you built these things. You built these cities because the fires destroyed it. You remember a series of devastating fires. You read all about them. You saw the pictures. What you're looking at here on the screen is just Bakersfield earthquake in 1952. Just some of the aftermath of it. One of the later earthquakes to destroy the area, Bakersfield having several of these. And so this series is focused on the counties. It was actually because of an observation I had had to myself, but it was confirmed by a YouTube user. And a fellow I've gotten to know a little bit, a solid guy of our community here. And his name is D-Star on YouTube. He was probably one of the first people that ever found the channel. He had pointed out to me how disappointed he was in that survey because having the residents of their of the state. He sees marvels all the time, wonderful buildings all the time, and a lot of them are just ignored. I, I found that that to echo the way I had felt as well. So because of that, I spun off and decided, well, go through the cracks in these historical, in these surveys, perhaps those were rounded up on the local side and they'd be featured in the National Register of Historic Places. And so use those as a focus and just go through county by county and see what we could see. Yes, there are some representation that you won't find on the survey some that that has its own set of narratives that has its own set of writers that, that fluctuate wildly and often what you find are what i'm finding are disputes between what the local people want to preserve and what's sort of forced on them by these well what i'm describing here is an overall sensation born from reading hundreds well let me just say that there's a lot of reading that goes into this uh i know i fly through the photographs and improvising as i go the reading that takes place each site will have 10 pages or you know more or less six or seven pages of text on average some of them have 50 some of them have two it's a wide range so in a county that may have 70 items on the registry it's a fair amount of reading those i do old school style this room looks like a, a paper bomb went off if i be to be perfectly honest with you it documents everywhere. Sometimes I dive into digital books on the side, old stuff I find from the 1800s about these counties. This particular Kern County, there's a book that was about 1,500 pages. And there's another uh, book about the biographical sketches of Fresno County and Kern County and Tulare County, and that one's another 1,500 pages or so. And this is something that you come to, this feeling. It's death by a million paper cuts. You're not going to read one registered places nomination and, and come to this conclusion. You're not going to read 10 and come to that conclusion, or 100. Somewhere around the few thousand mark, you start to get this overwhelming sensation that you've read all this before. You've heard all this before, and it starts to reek. And nothing, while I know it may not seem like it so far, this county alone, around this point, reached the most damning, to me, the most suspicious and tangible evidence that something is seriously wrong with these stories. And what I found in these history books shocked me. And there is no possible way one can deny that what's written by the explorers in these lands in these early days does not match the stories that they tell later. They leave out pretty much anything amazing or irrelevant to their narrative. And some of that stuff is fascinating. And the stories that they come up with are very interesting. You see, California was settled so late and so abruptly that it becomes obvious. It's sort of like whatever happened with the powers that be a few years ago where it seems like a monkey wrench was thrown into their spokes and they suddenly had to change or speed up their timeline and suddenly things that used to be a slow burn becoming more noticeable and california is the the beacon of bullshit in, in that regard and nowhere so far that i found to be to be more evident than this county so this may end up being very long and dry and boring but i assure you there's something very sinister here oddly enough this coincided with me testing out to this live stream stuff i had just recently stumbled upon this folder full of photographs of uh, child labor, essentially. Thousands of pictures of child labor uh, on the Library of Congress, all from the same era, Dust Bowl era type stuff. And I thought there was, uh, I'm curious, 
That, coupled with what I found while looking at some of these areas in Kern County out of curiosity, led me to believe that something very dark and sinister happened in this area, in this part of the world, that we need to atone for as a nation. Come to terms with this, and it may include looking backwards at the so-called golden era of our country and our even maybe relations. Some of the things they maybe were unwitting or knowingly involved in that they remained silent about. It can get ugly when, when, that, when that mirror gets shown to people and it's not a pleasant subject. I wanted to just interject that before I go forward because I believe there'll be a marked sh shift in tone as you... I've recorded this portion later and I'm injecting this into the video. I think it will help shed some light on the discovery process that I kind of go through in the next segment where I'm kind of discovering some of this as I go and you can hear the outrage as it's dawning on me and maybe I'm just a paranoid fool and there's nothing here something I was considering the other day and I, this is probably the wrong place in time for this but I was going to do this going to do sort of a live stream from time to time I actually there's something about it that doesn't sit right with me and now I may get the capability and buy a camera and stuff so that I have a conversation with others on the air platforms if the opportunity arrives again but as far as you all are concerned I don't really like being the only voice. You don't want the microphone and have... Uh, I, I rather engage with people personally. And so I'm considering just setting up some sort of a uh, Discord channel or a, or something to that nature where we can sort of have chats. And if you're interested, you can you can we can just talk directly and exchange ideas that way. And if no, there's no interest in that, that's fine as well. But to me, that feels better than me trying to be on some platform. That, I don't want there to be this divide. Um, and so if there's any interest in that, let me know in the comments, or you can shoot me an email, um, <coughs> jackwhispers at protonmail.com, or you find me on Telegram at WhisperJack, and I'll eventually get around to it. How limited this registry is is shocking to me based on what I know to be there, because I've been there before. I've been to Kern River. I mean, the same, but I've been to, what is it, Lake Isabel? Isabella Lake? It's not a question. It's a place. Oh, here we go. Here we got some, some taste of the old world here, a little bit... Still hanging on here in this land of exploitation. And what we're supposedly looking at here is the Jastro building, also known as the Standard Oil building, of course, because everything in Kern County has to be just exploited to the max. It's all about industry here. And this is constructed in 1917 or 1921, it says. Made of hollow tile and faced with vitrified brick. The lobbies and corridors are of a mosaic tile, we're told, as a partial basement, which is now used for a cooling machinery. They are telling us that the first floor of the building is separated from what would be the basement level. But I would say that that means that it's not a, uh, not a single story building. It has a basement and all that. And uh, you know what that means. Now, the roots of this Standard Oil Company, with its very basic name, go back to 1879 with the Pacific Oil Company. Which entered Kern County in 1902, right on cue. And it became the Kern County's largest taxpayer for 25 years. Building refineries, bringing in oil fields, and they developed a great deal of oil property with vast holdings. It built its Central Valley office in Bakersfield in 1917, becoming one of the earliest oil companies to realize the potential of the Kern County oil fields. One of the few historic structures remaining in downtown Bakersfield, which is a shame. You can see it still hiding back there, despite its old age apparent by this old car. It was incorporated under the laws of the state of California February 19th, 1879, and for reasons unknown, reincorporated September 10th of that same year. Uh, it was per Pacific Oil Company was purchased by Standard Oil Company, which is out of New Jersey. And here it comes, bursting in the doorway with an 8-inch pipeline from Kern River and coaling fields all the way to the Richmond Refinery, which is the most important pipeline in California. Now, prior to this time, dry farming and cattle raising have been the major industries of this year, Baker. But not no more, there's a new sheriff in town, and boy is he oily. Now, what's confusing about this building is that it says, It was named for Henry Jastro, the original owner, whose heirs subsequently sold it to Standard Oil, which I don't understand because they claim it was built in 1917 and and the heirs of the man who was the original owner sold it, so the man died and had heirs who ended up selling the property all within the same year of it being built. That seems silly. And then it says here the original building was constructed at a cost of $110,000 by the same architect as so only a keen eye can discern the older building from the addition. 
Only the keen eye that you no doubt don't possess and the government does. Only they can tell. You don't have the eyes for it. Since Standard Oil vacated the building in the mid-60s, a mere 40 years after its, uh, instruction and restruction and destruction and reconstruction, it's unique here. It's one of the last remaining buildings of the Second Renaissance Revival architecture in the Bakersfield area. I love that Second Renaissance. Very, very fitting and telling. Match that of its neighbor to the east, the completely unrelated, just happened to mention in the survey, Kern County Land Company building. Completely unrelated. Nothing to see here. You don't worry about what kind of a conflict of interest you'll have, or you'll get a real conflict on your hands. All right, buddy? So you mind your own. Go back to playing or your board games or whatever you do on your spare time you fucking nerd <gasps> hold on and so yet again another slice of the history of the area that really doesn't have anything to do with the people it's just uh, the oil it's all about the oil and the industry here folks it's not about you or me or history or integrity just oil get it through your thick gulliver now here we've got a place called the carnegie library Dun, 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 dun. Oh wait, I wasn't done. Here's still the Jastro building. And really it is a handsome specimen. Not looking unlike many other things we've seen from this era, no doubt. Now what would a narrative in California be without some good old western timey stuff? You know, to sell you on the idea that this here is the wild wild west, these untamed parts, there weren't nothing here. And if you saw some, I'm here to tell you that you didn't. And uh, one of the celebrated sights on this one of the celebrated sites on this registry is the Walker Pass, which is interesting from a narrative point of view, but not from a building or point of view. As you can clearly see, the Walker Pass sort of fails to impress in this particular picture that they've chosen. But basically what it comes down to is you've got this gentleman named Joseph Walker, who you may have heard of, and he is the hardiest and most hailest and handsomest of fellers, who... With his men, part of the Bonneville Expedition, for entered California by crossing the Sierra Nevada next to the Yosemite Valley in 1833. And they claim the Native Americans showed them the way. And his exit from California is significant as the first known instance of a Euro-American passage through Walker Pass. The knowledge of which enabled the military and the commercial bastards to use it in later years. And this man, Walker, used it repeatedly throughout his life. Led the Joseph B. Childs... Immigrant party safely into the San Joaquin Valley and they made they brought wagons in of course They'd abandoned them at Owens Lake before reaching the pass But still the child's party is the first American immigrant wagon train to reach the Sierra Nevada The first to cross Walker Pass and the very first overland immigrant parties to reach interior California except for of course the Native Americans who already lived there and showed them the past would imply that they would actually be the first overland immigrant party. Uh, I'm not sure why we're dehumanizing them. But nonetheless, that's what Mr. Walker was all about. And this is actually like a 40-page document. It really, it's his autobiography about all the times he went everywhere across the United States and how he didn't keep much of a journal. But when he did, he lost it in the river. He was active and long-lived for a trapper, trader, and guide, but uh, it's because of him that he, you know, we have... Allegedly to thank the consolidation and expansion of the base of geographic knowledge available to us at the time So he's a unique significant figure in American history if he existed However, we have to remember this is very ultimately detrimental to Native American peoples Although he fought with them he allegedly married into and lived with and defended the Shoshone tribe for many years But he still was um, involved in many violent confrontations with them and what to make of all that. But of course, you gotta have the wild, wild west. You gotta have a story for everything. And this here is Walker Pass. Says right there, he did it. He walked it. Mr. Walker did. Yes, sir. We sell you on the narrative of what this place is all about back then. And this is a place called Robber's Roost. The historic and scenic landmark. Tibutico Vasquez. The notorious bandit. The bandido. They tell me that the a gentleman of adventure. That's a polite way of saying he's a burglar. Mi señor Vasquez, his first appearance upon the desert scene was in the early months of 1874. No, no otra desperado in California bandido history was his peer. He started his career about the middle of the century. Before coming to the interregions of California, he served a number of years in prison. Okay. Okay, free he becomes a free man in the 1860s. He feared the state owed him a living, 
because uh, the time he spent in prison. So he returned to his lawlessness, okay? He joined the bandit group and became leader of his own band. And made bold by success, he planned this operation in the desert country where he hears stories of rich miners and wealthy travelers coming to this area, okay? Now, in this vicinity of Cerro Gordo in Inyo County is the goal of the gang. They plan to secure the loot by money, take the money and jewels, and easier to get away with that than the heavy gold. He made the first appearance at Coyote Halls, which is a state station where the walker pass meet the road to Los Angeles. And he keep a camp here in this craggy peak here. From this day, from that day, this rock seen from Highway 14 has become known as Robber's Roost, okay? So his gang of bandidos continue to operate along the highways until army come from in the Camp Independence to make an effort to capture them. This discouraged him and he left the region and returned to uh, Los Angeles. Uh, eventually he finally captured and returned to San Jose. He's tried for murder, which I didn't know even though he did till this moment. He was convicted and then they hang him on March 19th, 1975, which is actually today is the celebration of that very day. He make an enemy of one of his gang because he finds favor with the man's wife. And that's what happened. At least that's what the story told me. So anytime you see this uh, craggy rocky with these crevices and caves and all the protection that it perhaps offer, know that this idiot bandit hang out here because he wanted to be seen from every direction. And so that's why they catch him probably so easy. That's the story anyways. Can I sit down now? Well, thanks, sir. Uh, thanks, Rodolfo. You've been great. And what would the Wild Wild West be without? The uh, Railroad Depot. Uh, this one's in my favorite named city of all time, maybe. Shafter. Shafter? I hardly know her, am I right? Yeah, you can boo that one. This is an excellent example of the standard combination frame depot, says the paper. Not me, because I don't know what that means. It was designed by Santa Fe engineers in February of 1911. I'll tell you what it means. The word combination means it used for freight, passengers, and express service. This train carries everything. Um, it, was, it was constructed by Santa Fe employees in 1917. Shafter, then but a mere colony, had been the center of farming activity. The center. The colony, then was the newest in Kern County, had been prosperous in its few years of existence, and the coming of a railroad encouraged new growth. And so we've heard time and time and time again. In fact, after a 10-year period of growth, the office portion was expanded to accommodate influx of commerce. The building was finally abandoned in 1978. Again, another 60 years, 70 years later. The Santa Fe Railroad declared the depot surplus property and in December it was turned over to Shafter Historical Society with the stipulation that it must be removed from railroad property or be destroyed. And there's another stipulation that $900,000 liability insurance be taken up to cover the workers removing the building. Very odd thing to include. At the time, the Shafter Historical Society consisted of a small but determined group of citizens who felt that the depot had great potential as a historic building. So after a period of eight months, they were able to raise $20,000 and arrange to move the building to donated property three blocks down the rail, which foiled the plans of the state. The Historical Society contacted the Kern County Museum regarding the proper removal, and in 1980, they removed it and relocated it where it will serve as a home for people who go to the museum, which is no one. No one goes to museums anymore. And so there, in your face, the Historical Society wins one. That's, by my count, that's one to about a million. But still, it's one. We're on the board, baby. We're on the board. What weird orders. You must destroy it. And take out a million dollar insurance policy. There she goes. Crying again. Shafter Depot. Here we have the Tevis block, which looks like this today. A fine specimen, but back then it looked more like... And what we're looking at is a block. Well, what you're looking at, the, the majority of the Tavis block is actually the Kern County Land Company. Sounds very benevolent, doesn't it? Designed by the very prominent architect Henry Schultz. And Kern County Land Company was the center for much of the land development in Kern County because the company owned hundreds of thousands of acres of land in the area. Interesting. One of the last early buildings in the downtown Bakersfield which retained its architectural in architectural integrity, except for the, I'm sorry, the oil building across the street. It's an imposing two-story structure, imported brick walls, the last vestige of the corporation that was so important in the development of one of California's richest counties. One of the wealthiest counties, right? The, the rising tide, the late lifted every ship. 
This landmark in Bakersville has been a landmark since its construction in 1893, the oldest commercial building in downtown Bakersville to have survived earthquakes and remodeling efforts. More importantly, remodeling efforts. Most of the buildings that survived the 1952 earthquakes have been remodeled. However, the current county land company building has not suffered that plight. We needed something to wave around as our heritage, after all. Owners have taken a careful approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's the history. James Ben Ali Hagen and his brother-in-law, Lloyd Tevis, both successful lawyers from San Francisco, incorporated Kern County Land Company with 400,000 and 500,000 acres of land with Kern River water rights and canals and ditches as its assets. Okay, hold on. How exactly does one simply incorporate Kern County Land Company with a million acres of land and current and water rights to the river with canals and ditches that are obviously already there as your assets. How does that work? Only a successful San Francisco lawyer could figure out how to be so shady. Hagen, Tevis, and an earlier partner, W.B. Carr, realized very early the importance of water and irrigation, you think, for cattle raising and farming in the San Joaquin Valley. But as they drained more and more water from the river, an intense rivalry developed with the partnership of Henry Miller and Charles Lux. They filed lawsuits, and after seven years of better litigation, a settlement was reached. Hagen and Tevis got 75% of water rights. Two years after the settlement, in 1890, Kern County Canal and Water Company was formed, which in later years became a part of Kern County Land Company's water division. So benign. Look away. A boring title for this boring company. For 50 years, the primary operation of this land company was cattle raising. This was successful. And it was extensive, covered 2 million acres in California, Arizona, and New Mexico. Most of the hay, the grain, and the alfalfa used for feeding the cattle was grown also on Kern County land. Farming on Kern County land company fell into three different categories. I don't know why I'm stuck on this one picture, that was really whack. Orchard and vineyards, row crops, and land leasing. Over 100,000 acres were leased from the extreme end of the San Joaquin Valley, north of McFarland, while the rest was farmed by the county land company itself. The usual rent was 25% of the crops, if cotton, and somewhat less for other crops. So if the tenant farmer's crop failed, he didn't owe rent for that season. And this system would allow the tenant farmer to use all his capital and credit on seed, equipment, fertilizer, and necessary labor to produce a large harvest without worry about losing his land. Kern County Land Company kept a staff of soil experts, agronomists, engineers, and irrigationists, which were made available to the tenant farmers, and the result was a large-scale farming done through the combination of big farm accessibility and small farm efficiency. Beginning in the 40s, row crop and orchard and vineyard farming received a, a boost from a very unlikely source, which was oil. Revenues received from oil grew, and more and more money was put into improvement and development of land for farming. Oil was not only giving credit for boosting the economy, but also providing the land company with capital to develop row crop farming at a large scale. By 1936, oil and gas was the richest source of income for Kern County Land Company, and that time Shell brought in an oil well in Kern County Land Company's 10th section field, which is the first in California to be discovered through the use of reflection seismography, which is a method utilizing explosives to show, quote, underground structures not visible above ground. Why wouldn't you put underground formations? Underground structures? Seems, you know, like they were constructed. I don't know what we're saying there. Are we, are we giving up the ghost here? Soon oil royalties soon constituted 75% of Kern County, and the stock rose from $33 a share in its initial release to 450 a share in 1938, and made one of the largest oil companies in the U.S. However, Kern did not limit itself to cattle raising, agriculture, and oil and gas. Of course not. It also had, of course, you know, water rights and irrigation and all that, but also manufactured ultralight microwave tubes and uh, car jacks, oil filters, metal stampings, automobile tailpipes, and exhaust systems. Any way to fuck up your air, they'll do it. They also founded gas processors, which produced equipment for separating liquids from natural gas and drying them so as to have the ability to place them into pipelines economically, even at wells of small gas production. Now, hold on a second here. Henry Schultz is the architect that was well known in San Francisco. He's the one that made the Preston Castle that we looked at in Amador County, which we they swore was a, was a, not a prison for boys, and it, and, but it was more of a, a place for the you know juvenile hall, basically for them to make product, basically a form of slavery. Now, I wouldn't think too much of this actually. This uh, Kernland County, but something happened the other day that now I'm starting to wonder exactly how skewed these histories are. And of course, I know most of it's a lie, 
But I don't mean that. I mean, I guess it never occurred to me how skewed they were. Lying, you're just making stuff up. All we hear about in this county is the richest county ever. And everyone rushed here and got gold. And how this, this company owned it. So benevolent, though, they didn't, they didn't charge much rent. They, like, they provide all these tools for the farmers to succeed and all that. And I would have no reason, I guess, to challenge that. Except the other day, I happened to be... These old world buildings here. What the hell is going on here? I'm just build all that. Cowboys building all that in between there. Going out foul. Yeah, right. You show me a cowboy what needs a princess castle like that. And I was on the, uh... Oh, we'll just do it together here. I was on the National Archives. Randomly punched in Kern County. I've been researching the subject. And what I found was something kind of interesting. Which coincided with something else I've been looking at lately. Now I'm starting to wonder... What the fuck's going on down there in Kern County? Now, I also happened to find, uh, a completely unrelated note the other day, a large library of child labor photographs that was on the Library of Congress. I actually put a bunch of them in a video, which actually got flagged because even though the kids are clearly like 100 years old by now, apparently there's children in it, so it was a bad thing. But it's like, I didn't put them on Library of Congress. That was you that did that. I punched in Kern County, and then what I got kind of surprised me. As you can tell, I didn't look very far. It was just right here. And looking at photographs of Kern County, I come across this place called Oildale, which is still a town, but this is called Oildale Shack Town. Here's a picture right here. And it says that uh, landlords, people could live for free. The rent was free or very cheap. Uh, this is a shack town, an industrial district on Kern County Water Company's property, supervised by the county. Families built shelters here out of whatever materials they could find or acquire because ground rent was free. And I'm looking at this house, and I'm realizing that, man, it pulled up in this car, somebody. Probably never left that place ever again. And you got a house here made of cardboard box roofs, pallets, and... I mean, it's a shanty town. It's a shack. Okay. Some people, uh, you know, fall in hard times. I'm not bagging on that. I'm saying families lived here on Kern County land for free. So these people are employed by Kern County Land Company. I don't see no rising tide raising all ships. You mean to tell me that the owners of millions of acres of land that's involved in oil, dry cattle grazing, alfalfa farming, all this can't even provide basic housing for the families that are doing all the labor. Just said, you can live here. If you, you can build your house out of trash. And uh, that's exactly what they did. And you can see, it's not just one. It's a whole neighborhood built up of bits of fencing, bits of pallets, barrels. You're lucky if you got a chimney. You're lucky if you got, I mean, what is this roof? You got one piece of corrugated metal here. It looks like he's trying. I'm not faulting the man. But the thing is, it's not just a man, though, either. Remember, it said families. I mean, there's kids in there. They got pictures of them. And, um, this is, uh, this is kind of heartbreaking. What kind of monsters don't even build sheds for their people? Land which they acquired for free, basically. I mean, I'm telling these are the two lawyers that just waltzed in and incorporated a million acres and got all the canals in the land. They didn't dig them canals. They didn't dig those ditches. They didn't develop this land. It sounds like it was already developed. And this is how they treat their employees? And their employees with kids, even? And then you gotta wonder, times must be very hard. Families that chose to do that. Which reminds me of the exhibit we were looking at just before. The Weed Patch Camp and all that. And that little joke I made about forced migration. And you know, I just can't help but think that you've got this Irish potato famine, magically, that displaces enough people. Think about how desperate you'd have to be if you put yourself there. You're a man living a rural life with a family, wife and kids, and the potatoes run out or whatever happens over there, and you're so desperate, or you've been pumped up with such hope, either way, that you pack up all your shit, you get on, you scrape together whatever you can, and you buy passage on a rickety wooden boat, where you're going to get in this boat and set sail, and weeks later, hopefully, weather conditions permitting, and you don't die or boat doesn't get hijacked or you run out of food or disease or whatever a million things that can happen on that journey boat capsized you're gonna go to a strange continent you never heard before never been there before you're gonna land there and then you're gonna travel to the middle of the united states by wagon to a plot of land scratched 
scratch a field and do it and raise a family, build a house, etc. Now, I'm not saying that didn't happen. I'm saying, yeah, it happened. <laughs> There's plenty of people that it definitely happened to. A story of my family, essentially. What I'm saying is imagine the desperation that you'd have to be in to do that. Or imagine this pipe dream that you've been sold to do that. Now, maybe back then they could actually come true. Maybe you could start out like this and then you could end up, you know, having a house. But that's, that's you know, you're part of a situation of exploitation that you don't, you're not even aware of. And you are working hard and you, you people do, do deserve it. But I just mean, I see this here. Then you got these people, these parasites, they go further out west. Oh, there's more out here. What do we do? I don't know. But somehow we got to get them people on the move again. Suddenly you get these Okies, you call them, coming out here. You're mean to them, outsiders, make them form their own camps, make them kind of live on their own. And this is what you get. And I mean, imagine the situation that you'd have to be in. Do you see those kids over there? There's not just one. The whole handful of them. And so then you read the history of this country, you know, by way of these historical registries. We're supposed to be preserving our culture and heritage. And uh, they don't mention this. They act like the current company, land company, just the sweetest, sweetest pie. They done gave everybody the, you know, their own ability to succeed. And if your crop fails, you don't owe nothing. I mean, these kids are living in a place that was literally built out of fucking paper. They don't care. They're happy. But that's not the point. They're probably tougher and stronger and better people than we have today. And that's fine. But that's not the point. The point is that they're not telling the story straight at all. This is exploitation. And then I'm reminded of all the pictures that I found of all the kids working all those jobs and the migrant trains, the orphan trains. And you start to realize that these people, these parasite freaks, they come out here and they annihilate anyone that's in their way. Move into wherever they want. Re recondition, repurpose these houses however they want. Dig up the oil so much that they're causing earthquakes by removing the lubricant from the earth, which is what I believe happens. They're digging up the coal and they're burning coal in the air. When we before, we probably had, chances are we had nice electric trains. Didn't need coal. Steam. Why well, you don't need coal to burn coal to create steam. My iron creates steam. You They... they Teared out these electric railways and they put in highways with which to burn more fuel. Any way they can, they just herd everybody together. And then they destroy the earth until the vein, the mine vein runs dry, whatever it is. The copper runs out, the silver runs out, or the yield isn't good enough. Then they just dump, walk away from all the, walk away from everything. Walk away from these towns they created with all these people. And leave a few drifters that are there. And just walk away from it all and go live up on the hill. And then they, then they write their own histories and they paint themselves out to be such great, and it's all a big club. Now, I'm not saying anything you may not know, but I just mean, is it ever been more evident than these pictures? Is it ever been more evident than with the stories that they're trying to tell, which I didn't expect to find this here. I didn't expect to find any of this. I'm just looking at the damn buildings. And what I'm finding is, this is a massive cover-up. The whole reason this registry exists, it seems to be, is to cover this up. And so I actually went out, so I'm going to hit the books hard on this, because I want to know more about this. But we'll do, um, I'll do real quick these last few here. There's a couple things that are mentioned on here that aren't really, there's no photographs on the registry, okay? Wait, this happens on all of them. Every uh, county has a few locations, especially if they're Native American, they don't give you the address, they don't give you pictures, they don't give you any information about it. But I managed to find a couple things. First one is the Last Chance Canyon, which is in El Paso Mountains. And I'm only doing this just to be thorough. And they claim that there's rock shelters and mills and quarries and stuff. There's a Burrow Schmidt tunnel, which is a, a mining tunnel. Apparently some guy dug with hand tools for 38 years. A guy named Burrow. Uh, many times he got stuck in there. And he began this tunnel in 1900. Six feet tall and ten feet wide. Cut through solid granite bedrock. And uh, he finally achieved his goal in 1938. Dug through 2,500 feet of solid granite using a pick, a shovel, and a hammer. And some dynamite. He never even used the tunnel to move ore. Instead, he just sold it and moved away. So, who knows if that story's even true. There's some land dispute over who owns it. Then there's a Long Canyon Village site, which is a inhabited by a tribe of people who used the home as a winter home. And there's a women's club that's, un, that's delisted for some reason. And then there's, then there's the real cherry on top of the sundae. And this is a two-part cherry. 
And it is a two-part cherry of maximum fuckery. Though it won't seem like that at first. The first part is a little place called Rogers Dry Lake. You may have heard of it. There are no pictures on the registry. As if it couldn't be any more um, obvious that this uh, entire county is just the hotbed of lies. Of course, Rogers Dry Lake would be here. Of course, where the Dryden Flight Research Facility, which became profoundly impactful on the presence of the space technology and military security, which enabled NASA to be formed. The king, the chief lie, the mother of all lies. So first in 1933, a small advance party comes from Marchfield and Riverside to design a bombing range for the Army Corps. They found the place to be ideal for, you know, flight. And four years later, the entire Corps was performing bombing and gunnery maneuvers here using P-38s and B-52s. And, and um, they had a realistic 650-foot replica of a Japanese heavy cruiser out here. They ran the test of the uh, XP-59A. Edwards Air Force Base it became known as, and which morphed into NASA Flight Research Center, which morphed into the home of hypersonic research, and the Kennedy Space Center. Usually uses lake bed runway 23 as a landing strip. So this place made possible the successful development and testing of generations of American aircraft leading to the space shuttle. And of course, it would be here in Kern County, where that begins. But not just there. We've got a little place, a little unassuming little place on this registry. This little homely little nice little place, the old stone house of Cortland Gross. That's right. The old stone, look at this little quaint little place. Just the kind of place you want to pat little kids on the head. Or, is that a sexy furnace over there? Oh my god. Another time then. In any case, uh, here, here you have it, the old stone house. So quaint. Well, what gives? Why is this so important? Well, if you ask me, it's not. It's not very important. But if you ask someone on the staff of the National Register of Historic Places, it's worth fighting for. Now this house is less than 50 years of age, we're told, and this writing was done in 19-whatever, 80? It's of exceptional importance, we're told, not only for the unusual architecture, but for the persons involved. The architect and the owner, owner Cortland Gross, was president of a subsidiary, Vega Airplane Company, a, a subsidiary of Lockheed Aircraft. Ah, uh, and there it is, the penny drops. Right? Your local celebrity slash deep state member. He was president of Lockheed. Uh, by 1956, and he was chairman of the board for Lockheed, where he remained until his retirement in 1967. A long, storied history with Lockheed. Now, not only that, but this house is one of the few buildings designed by the important California architect Donald Parkinson, who's one of the one of his last commissions and the last residents. He didn't really design very many, and it's notable for its use of stone, which is unusual in California and in Donald Parkinson's repertoire. The this is an exception to the rule, because the only houses he ever built, Mr. Parkinson, were Amelia Earnhardt and Paul Mance, and this one. Now, this wasn't Cortland Gross's actual house. This is just the way he sort of got away. He actually had a palatial, we're told, a palatial mansion uh, somewhere near Fresno. Now, we're told that Donald Parkinson specialized in steel frame office and bank buildings, sky rises high. He did the, uh, the Memorial Coliseum. He did the the buildings for the uh, uh, the exposition. He never did anything with stone. So, what gives? Mr. Parkinson is another who's who. Him and his dad, Don and John. They went to MIT. He went from 1917 to 18, so less than a year. He served in the air service. Was honorably discharged. Somehow he got the rank of lieutenant within a year. He resumed his studies at MIT, gets his Bachelor's of Science in 1920. Then he goes abroad to study European monuments for a year. He attends the American Academy in Rome as a, quote, special student. He gets married that same year after he returns all the way back to L.A. and settles down to the practice of architecture with his father, John and Don Parkinson. Now, they, uh, before, they used to just do Beaux-Arts classicism, but now they, they started using uh, 
with their small firm of 30 employees, they became preeminent in L.A. They did bank leaders, homes, business officials, municipal officers. That's what they're... They were just the, uh, the elite's go-to architecture, allegedly. Now, Donald Parkinson was also appointed to the Municipal Arts Commission. He attended his first meeting as a commissioner in October 1927, was reappointed, and he served through the 20s. He was a member of the Earthquake Advisory Committee, but he never forgot his passion for flying, which he had never done yet, but still, he had a passion for it somehow. He was director of Bow Plus Sailplanes for some reason, and secretary and director of Paul Mant's Air Service for some reason. And um, his love of flying led him back to the armed service. So in 1942, he rejoins the army and he serves through the years involvement in World War II. From 42 to 43, he was a major now in the Corps of Engineers. And then he retired after less than a year, before the war was even over. I don't even know that was possible. Well, this sport of flying would produce dividends for him because he succeeded in securing commissions for Cortland Gross close association with individuals who would play a significant role in the formation of an aerospace industry led him to designing their assembly plants and their General Motors assembly plant and therefore this stone house. Unfortunately, Donald Parkinson suffered a heart attack at the age of 50 and died in 1945. He had a son, however, named Don Parkinson. So the John and Don show could potentially still go on. Cortland Gross, Cortland Sherrington Gross, was... He graduated from Harvard in 1927 as an English major, English literature, and began working in an investment banking firm with his brother, Bob. Bob ventured into the aviation industry, taking a position with New Haven's Viking Flying Boat, which produced seaplanes. Then Bob and six of his associates bought the bankrupt Lockheed Company for $40,000. Cortland Gross was named manager of the New York office, where he spent seven years negotiating aircraft sales. Landed a contract with British Air for 200 bombers and $25 million, the largest single contract received by a U.S. aircraft manufacturer in the world. He was elected president, and yeah, 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 we've been all through this. Now, that's where the story should end. That's where my foray into this rather mundane house, on a rather mundane survey, with these tell-nothing pictures, that's how it should end. Here's the house now, after it's been vandalized in the 80s. In 78. Now, we're told that the earthquake that took out Tehachapi did not uh, harm this house at all. It was one of the few houses that remained standing, despite its stone structure. And everyone was shocked, no doubt. But despite that, it was abandoned and stayed abandoned for 20 plus years. So that's a little funny. But here's where it just gets downright stupid. And maybe this is um not interesting to anyone. I mean, I don't know how it could be. I don't know how it could be interesting, but there was a challenge. Uh, within the National Registry of Historic Places to that property. A challenge on the merits of... I see this very rarely. I've only seen this in California, a few places. Well, I guess I've only really looked in California, so... But the challenge was that this was not Mr. Gross's community. No one knew him there. He was not there at the home very often. If You know, very rarely used it. He wasn't... Uh, during the years where he was uh, famous... And was a mover and shake in the world. He didn't had nothing to do with the property. It wasn't 50 years old. So it wasn't very old. He was not a member of this community. And usually they don't honor people. There's a couple other criteria. So rather than just let that fall by the wayside. And say okay. Someone really within this uh, inner circle. Really needed to sell this narrative. Is the only thing I can think of. I don't know why they would. Because they go to bat for this property. And they go strong. And they don't do it in the way that you should do it, like as if, as, as if as an architect would. They don't talk about the merits of the house as an architectural district. They don't go by the street. They wax on like a New York Times fuck, like a New York Times fluff bag writer. It starts this this rebuttal to this challenge starts with the inner sanctum, the solitude of stone, and this is a poem by Ralph Waldo Emerson or an excerpt from it. One hour of thoughtful solitude may nerve the heart for days of conflict girding up its armor to meet the most insidious foe. That's a poem by Percival. It is easy in the world to live after the world's opinion. It is easy in solitude to live after your own. But the great man is he who in the midst of the crowd keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. A poem by Ralph Waldo Emerson. This is how this starts out in this registry. Already I just want to punch this person in the face. 
Reviewers of the petition for national registration of the Cortland Gross Stonehouse, Tehachapi, Kern County, expressed concern that Mr. and Mrs. Gross used the property and stone structure under consideration infrequently for weekend holidays. Evidence we've gathered thus far strongly supports the contention that the Tehachapi home built by Gross was conceived as an inner sanctum, a haven of solitude with extreme pressures and responsibilities associated with high-level management were assuaged and mitigated. Seeking an environment which would support solitude, Mr. Gross desired to build a retreat where his inner strengths would be renewed. In order to accomplish and realize this wish, Gross looked back in time to an earlier, less complicated period of his youth. You see, born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1904, Cortland Gross was raised with an intimate familiarity with the more enlightened examples of colonial architecture in the New England area. He was particularly drawn to the Pennsylvania Dutch and Massachusetts expressions of the colonial articulation. He refined his youthful appreciation for colonial architecture while a student at Harvard University. You know, his English major. Graduated in 1927, he completed his studies and had occasion to study and become familiar with the 18th century English and Dutch literary sources influencing colonial architecture in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. Fondly looking back on his uncomplicated life as a youth growing up in New England, Gross decided in the late 30s to build a retreat for himself and his family which would encompass those principles of life he so affectionately recalled. You, it goes on and on and on like this for 20 fucking pages. In the 30s, he, he decided to look back at his uncomplicated life as a youth growing up in New England. He graduated in 1927 with an English major. So because he studied 18th century English, who were allegedly sources that influenced colonial architecture, he needed to build a stone house in Tehachapi. What are we doing here? This goes on and on and on about concern being expressed that the stone house was not occupied during the period that he achieved historical significance. And this goes on to talk about his achievements. How he goes to England and ironed out a contract with the British Air Ministry. How he was besieged with difficult questions. How he, his integrity, his supreme confidence, the resoluteness of his will. Flying back to New York, he had secured a contract for 250 bombers. Now the story changes for $25 million contracts. Now look at this. This story actually says that upon his return to the U.S., he was faced with the delicate task of circumventing the United States Neutrality Act, which forbade the shipment of American military goods from the United States to Britain. So in order to deliver these bombers, when the United States was not in the war and was neutral, he formulates a strategy which he sees, which he, he the Lockheed Aircraft Corporation buys a wheat farm on the North Dakota-Canada border. As the Hudson bombers rolled off the Burbank assembly plant, American pilots ferried the planes to the Lockheed farm. Teams of horses would be hitched to each aircraft immediately after landing and pulled across the border into Canada. No longer on U.S. soil and subject to the Neutrality Act, Canadian, quote, farmers unhitched the horses and turned the planes over to English pilots who ferried the bombers to England where they were desperately needed to kill people. This farm proved to be a master move. And because of this, Lockheed Aircraft emerges a big league contender in the aerospace industry. Okay. We are, and it says, uh, he helped to transform the United States into President Roosevelt's arsenal of democracy. Am I understanding this right? He broke the law. He broke the law. He violated the United States Neutrality Act by selling, manufacturing planes and dragging them off out into Canada. And we're admitting this and celebrating this? Three years before we entered the war? How is this not public knowledge? Why, why am I learning about it here in this strange registry? So by the time the United States declared war in 1941, Cortland Gross had already acquired four years of war production management skills. He'd already been in there. Does this sound familiar to what happens, what's going on today? It sure does. To Ma Brian. Now this goes on and on and on. And I'm not going to read the whole damn thing. It's ridiculous. Because they're defending, the, the, the year in question was 1942 to 1950, which the original registry was arguing that that year he wasn't even around this house. It was not significant. For some reason... This article says, yes, he was, because there was an article, a cover story on him in, in Time Magazine, February 11th, 1966, which brought the aviation magnate to the consciousness of the public. Since he took over the, as presidency in 1961, and the Time article pointed out that Lockheed had received in 1976, how's that possible? Ten years, the Time article points out that in ten years in the future, they received over 7% of all contracts? The article came out in 1966. So... What was going on here? Not only that, they say that much of the credit for Lockheed's success belongs to him. He was president for 15 years. In the Pentagon, Robert McNamara looks up to him. 
he, you know, they're waxing on and on about this guy. But then they're saying that he developed this gift during 29 years. He played second fiddle at Lockheed to his older brother. 29 years? Okay. That's the first bit that I don't understand. Then it goes into the John Parkinson and Don Parkinson. And it talks about how they emerged as leaders of designing structures that showcase the automobile. And that's their claim to fame. They built the very first automobile showroom. They built the very first, uh, with Bernard Maybeck, they built the very first uh, gas station. And they're credited with pushing this stuff on the American people. They also built the first department store building with a modern design catering to the phenomenon of automobile traffic with showroom windows designed to conceive and lure the motorists off the boulevard. And I just cannot help but feel like this is an integral part of the narrative. This architect, whether or not he existed, and the way that he designed the first gas station the first automobile showroom, the first uh, department store window <laughs> exhibition, coupled with the man that allegedly landed the deal with England, uh, enabled us to sell planes in New to into World War II far years earlier than the American people wished for, but we're celebrating him. Brought put Lockheed Martin on the map. So this is the story that they need to get out. This is some for some reason they feel the need to get out there to the point where they're writing a thirty-page document about this stuff, and they're insisting that this stone house is the way to go. They're insisting that this is this is the only way in. This is the only way in. Everything else has been taken up, right? All the other buildings have been already assigned an architect. This is the only one they were able to assign to this guy. It was just some stone house in Tehachapi. They had to pretend it was this guy's vacation home. This is my guess, and they had to pretend it was designed by this other guy. So that they could then sell these narratives. Because it, that's the way in their mind, in the liar's mind, they're tying up the circle neat. Everything can be explained. Everything's got a place. Everything, everyone here, everyone's got a role. This is how it happened. This is how it went down. It's these people. And this is how you know. Because, of course, they existed because there's the house right there. And, of course, they existed because there's the... Right? So then I start to wonder, these people even exist? Sure, it would be hard to hide someone that's on the cover of Time magazine, right? But the real kicker for this article comes in the last page. And this actually had me... Uh, laughing out loud. First of all, it goes on to say that, oh, of course, every house is built from wood frame. That's why this one's so different, because it's made of stone. Yeah, yeah. Talking about the fire destroying everything everywhere except for the stone house. To hatch it be burnt down, and so they needed to build with bricks after two decades of disastrous fires. And then, because of the bricks, you see, they need all these bricks, so suddenly there was a bunch of lime kills in Kern County that, that popped up because of all these fires. Vast quantities of mortar and brick were produced by the Union Lime Company, which then went out of business and was abandoned, and that's where Parkinson was able to get the stone from the lime kill to build the stone house. Okay, so everything ties together real neatly, huh, Mr. Master Liars? Whether you got you have a reason for the bricks, you got a reason for the kill, and you got a reason for the stone, you got a reason for the fires, you got a reason for all of it. You got this little narrative so tight, and here comes some uppity guy in the register going, yeah, it's not really what we do here. So the real kicker is this. Keep in mind, this was written in 1980. This rebuttal was written in 1982. It goes on to say that uh, all these, uh, there was an earthquake in Tehachapi and somehow this stone house survived, but they abandoned it anyway, as we've discussed. The kicker is the last line. It says, reviewers of the gross petition indicated, as in the people that challenged this, are challenging this on another ground that we hadn't mentioned yet. And then it says it is general National Register policy not to list properties associated with living persons. Ooh, how are you going to get around on that one? Well, keep in mind, I'm reading from the rebuttal. So he states this is what the reviewers indicate. Well, it just so happens. That the next line says, Corlin S. Gross and his wife, Alexandra, and one of their servants were found slain in their Pennsylvania residence on the morning of July 16th, 1982. Pennsylvania police arrested Roger P. Buell for the July 15th slayings. The LA Times reported on January 19th, 1983, that Mr. Buell was found guilty of murdering the Mr. and Mrs. Gross and their servant. He received the death penalty for his wanton act of violence against the Gross household. Then he goes on to quote the eulogy, which may be the worst eulogy I've ever heard in my life. And that's how this article ends. The challenge is, well, we normally don't do that. We normally don't associate these properties with people that are living. And he says, aha, luckily for you, he died. He was slain. He was slain just in July. This year is written in 83. He was slain just a few months prior. And they've already found the dependent guilty. It's already been reported in the LA Times. Therefore, the property stands. And that's why the Stone House is on the list of registered historic places today. Can you believe that? So, what am I saying? 
they had this guy whacked just to get this property just to steal up the narrative? I have no idea. But it did make me wonder. And so I began the hunt. See you soon.